Marlowe. He is with the Department of Mathematics and Computer Sciences at Seton Hall University. Professor Marlowe has a Ph.D. in Computer Science and a Ph.D. in Mathematics from Rutgers State University. He has many publications in academic publications and has over 70 publications in various conferences and journals of mathematics, computer science, and information science. And his keynote address today is Everything Old is New Again. Professor Marlowe. Okay. This is, I think, my fourth plenary address here, and in the first three I more or less gave fairly serious sermons on the virtues of collaboration. And although I want to take what I'm presenting here very seriously, I don't want to give a sermon. I'm treating this more as a meditation. There is a bit of humor in it, and for those who would like a little more humor, please look at the page titles. So we start out with a problem, and the typical problem-solving method is to model the problem, propose a solution, evaluate it against the problem. And if it works, it's a solution. And if it doesn't work, we go back, we try again. Well, we finished it, right? We got the solution. Okay, I'm done. Let's, yeah, I can only wish. Right? So maybe not. So we have some questions. When should we go back and look again? When should we really go back and look again? And why don't we do it all the time? Okay, and another question would be, maybe we can make use of our current solution, or maybe it's an obstacle. Maybe we resolve the problem because something has changed and we find we're right back where we started. Maybe we're even back before we started. And I propose two examples, which I'll let you read. Okay. And software development. Okay, so, oh, wow. Problem changes into a new problem. We evaluate the old solution against the new problem. Whoops, doesn't match. So we get a new model. We get a new proposal. We evaluate that proposal. And with any luck, we have a new solution. Okay, so when do we do that? Well, certainly we're going to do it when we know the problem has changed. And usually that's obvious. We just break down. We get low-quality solutions. We get incomprehensible solutions. We start using technology that no longer exists. Okay, of course, have I said anything original? No, I have not. There are so many analogies to this across the STEM fields, business, programming. So why even talk about it? Well, what's the approach if we do do it? Let me say that before I do anything else. Well, we'll revisit our requirements, typical way of redoing the solution. Look at the requirements and constraints that are still in effect. Look at those that don't make sense anymore. Look at those that have to be tweaked. Add the new ones and get started. Nothing big. Okay, well, what problem do we have? Well, one problem we have is generally the original problem we solved took a long time to figure out. 
even with some process optimizations along the way, it may still be hard. So what we'd like to do is to try to look for something that's incremental, look for something that will let us reuse parts of the old solution, make minor changes to the old solution. may not work every time, but it's certainly worth a try. If it works 80% of the time at 10 per, and takes 10% of the time, then we've won on average. If, on the other hand, it works... 10% of the time and takes 80% of the time, we've added overhead. All right. So, well, okay, now we've said, okay, look and see when the problem stops working and resolve it and use an incremental technique if we can. Nice vanilla comment. Obviously, this is what we need to do. If we, or else throw it out. Stop. Well, Yes and no. One of the problems, one of the difficulties is that not all problems, not all questions have cut and dried yes, no answers. An answer that fits the constraints may not deliver good quality. May not satisfy the, the customer, the end user, the stakeholders. Further, for some problems, detecting when it fails is pretty easy. Or detecting when a supply chain fails because one of your suppliers goes out of business or there's a tsunami or something is pretty easy. Detecting slight changes in the quality of the part, detecting slightly increased risks, not so easy. And detecting the fact that we've missed opportunities to improve things is even harder. So a real problem is that a real difficulty, I keep doing problem, 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 is that problems don't exist in isolation, they exist in a context. And we can be solving the same problem and not changing the problem, but changing the context. So, even when a, the solution is, even when we solved a problem, we haven't changed, we got a solution that worked, we haven't changed the problem, we still may want to resolve. Okay. Why? Why? Well, we may get occasional failures. Unfortunately, we also get them when the problem works, when the solution works, because not every solution works perfectly all the time. We find suboptimal performance or bottlenecks, but if we don't know what optimal is, that may be hard to determine. And we don't know whether a bottleneck is inherent or an indication of a problem, a difficulty. Or we may just have a sense that we're missing something, that things have changed enough that we ought to do something. So what we need to do is periodically revisit the problem. And the question is, and look for a mismatch between Real life and the problem statement has the real world changed enough that we're no longer stating the problem in reasonable terms. Between the problem statement and the model, does the model still apply in the context we have? Between the solution process we have and the current options for the process. And we'll reevaluate the solution to see if we could come up with something better. So first we see if the solution still, if the problem still makes sense, then we see if the solution process still makes sense. Then we see if the solution still makes sense. And if it does, whether it's of the quality of either all is optimal. Okay, as I just said, it's not just a matter of checking whether you're correct, but revisiting a process, revisiting the solution and the solution process, 
does offer you an opportunity to rediscover the rationale and knowledge that both Susu and Ruth talked about. Because somewhere you've got it, I hope, and if not, you have to find it again. Ensuring that every one of your non-functional requirements and constraints still makes sense. In particular, some of your constraints may have come about because of the t forms and types of support institute, uh, infrastructure you had available versus those you have now. May have reflected the fact that you didn't have some numerical, some mathematical algorithms or procedures that you have now. We may have said, well, you have to solve it this way because we don't know anything better. Now maybe we do. Or may have respected the state of user or developer knowledge, knowledge base skills. 20 years ago, you could not count, necessarily 30 years ago, on a user being agile with the mouse, with dealing with tabs, and windows on the screen and so forth. Now I think three-year-olds can teach me some things. Right? So we would have had a solution that said, use a menu-based system. <laughs> because that's what's comfortable for people. Because that's what we can support easily. Because that's what people know how to use. Nowadays, they're very much deprecated in most contexts. Especially big menus. So... So another problem is we've decided to use these incremental techniques, and maybe they keep working. But one of the problems with incremental techniques, and somebody else was talking about this at the conference, but unfortunately I forget whom, is that they tend to converge to local solutions. In fact, it was one of the things that uh, one of the keynote speakers mentioned. And without getting into the full generality of problems, we need to make jumps away from where we are now and then and try to come back to a solution and see if it leads us to somewhere different and better. Okay, this is just sort of the... And finally, as we've said before, it's not enough to revisit the solution. We have to sometimes revisit the solution process and even revisit the evaluation fun function. The evaluation function, first, every now and then we should check it to make sure we didn't make a mistake. It may have worked well in the past, but it may not be the best we could have done. Or for omissions that could have been added or may have not been able to be added for reasons we just went through. Another reason is if, the, if we're doing a large state space exploration 15 years ago, this wouldn't have been feasible. The state space was large enough. We didn't have enough storage space on the machine or externally. The computers didn't work fast enough. And maybe the algorithms weren't good enough. So we need to incorporate new knowledge, context, techniques, algorithms, and infrastructure into our approach. Okay, and this is much harder when we're trying to solve for a process. So find the best way to manufacture something. And it's even harder when we start out with saying, here's a process that's a problem and we need to solve for another process. Using a process. And, of course, it's also hard when we have to deal with issues that are strongly affected by institutional learning and culture and by collaboration, cross-culture collaboration. Okay, now I get into... Okay, and again, key point is not only do we possibly change the solution, we may get other benefits. Broader applicability, 
faster solution algorithm procedures, broader uh, new uses for the solution, new uses for the process, and possibly alternative strategies. Okay, but again, life isn't that simple. Life is never that simple. I keep making things harder. Why? Because they are harder. Because now what we've done is we said, well, okay, let's go back and solve the problem. Now let's solve the problem again. Now let's solve the problem again. Now let's solve, the oh, wait, let's examine our objective functions. Oh, wait, let's examine our solution procedure. Now solve the problem again. Solve the, oh, wait, let's. You're never using it. You can't continually be examining your, your solution process. You have to sometimes do work, billable hours. Of course, if you're in the business of doing the solution, yeah, sure, go ahead. So what we need is to try to estimate when. And we need to get easy triggers. Otherwise, evaluating triggers that take a lot of time and a lot of effort is no better than doing this again. So you need something that's fairly quick. It needs to be reasonably easy to evaluate. And it has to be pretty close. Okay, where, what are sources of change? And I'll just let you look at that. They're sort of obvious, and I'm sure we could keep adding half a dozen more. I could ask for volunteers, and we could make the list go on about four more slides. Okay, but I'll identify those as some of the most significant ones. Okay, of course, just because we revisit in this case, because we say it's time to look at this again, doesn't mean we'll change anything. And it doesn't mean we'll change what we think we're changing. <laughs> so there's my overview. When am I going to look for change? There's going to be always a time trigger. Money, people, skills, knowledge, support, and this issue that says if there's collaboration involved, collaboration. So you set some time scale, and these are just very, very bad guesses, but I have to make something. And... If enough time has passed and you're still using the product, still using the solution method on new case after case, it's probably worthwhile just to see if things have changed. If the context is still the same, if the problem is still the same, don't bother solving it again. Okay. If this product is supposed to make money or even supposed to break even in a nonprofit, say, and it's losing money badly, better look at it again. At least now and then. And if it's making a lot of money, well, buy, hire a couple more people and have them look at it. Not a lot always, but once in a while. If it's just sort of coasting along, then neither of these apply. Again, I can be argued with. Okay. Changes in your customer or user community may affect how you want to solve the problem or what the best solution is. Changes in your staffing may affect what you're allowed to do and may let you do more and get a better solution. 
And that could, could be understood in general terms, including consultants you have available to you. Change in the global knowledge base, in the discipline knowledge base, in the user knowledge base, or in personnel knowledge base, all suggest opportunities. When that gets to some threshold, maybe it's a good idea to see if there are opportunities. Maybe it's a good idea to see if your solution is right, because maybe part of your time is spent doing things your user community has now adapted to doing for themselves or no longer need to do. Okay, pretty well said that already. <clears throat> Infrastructure platform. And my examples here are taken from software development and computer applications. But there are certainly comparable factors everywhere. As you get better communication, as you get computers that are faster, more, more highly optimizable, more storage, whether here or remotely, you can do more. Okay, what about collaboration? Well, if you have significant changes in your set of collaborators, you might want to relook at your problem. You might want to relook at your problem partly because you could be getting into some legal issues. It's unlikely if you drew the contract up right, but that doesn't mean you did. And when you do change the solution and you're part of a collaborative venture, what do you need to do? Well, you need to certainly to inform the partners when your piece no longer works until you get it working again. You certainly need to tell them of semantic changes to interfaces or guarantees, if you have to make them. You may want to inform them of changes in your performance or handling of certain cases in general because they may be able to use the better behavior of your piece to optimize their piece. Or to solve their problem differently but you can probably keep most of the internals hidden. So these are in some sense, uh, from the software point of view, not the legal point of view, contractual. This is optional, but you do it when you think it will be to your advantage. Or maybe when you want just simply to keep trust going. And this is to keep your own intellectual property proprietary. Okay, pretty obvious. You have this big structure. You examine hierarchically, you can either do it top down, bottom up, or starting with the most sensitive pieces. In general, you may want to subject the pieces that are sensitive to variation or to risk more frequently. And you have a risk. You don't want to get back to a situation that's the same overhead problem 
where you keep resolving and getting the same answer or thrash between a pair of answers. And so what you need to do is to set your threshold for the aspect that keeps triggering that, if it does, a little higher, at least for this component. Unless, as I said in the last slide, you know the component is very fragile, subject to security risks, subject to changes in call patterns, subject to evolution, in which case you may want to keep doing it anyway. Okay. One of the interesting things, I think, is that context change doesn't occur in isolation. As the other thing that keeps happening to most products is you keep doing patches, particularly software projects. So there's a known approach called refactoring, which I'm sure most of you know about, that says you keep building up these kludges and that keeps making the code look or feel or s smell worse and worse. And eventually you stop and you s or your documentation drifts further and further from the code. And at some point you stop and you say, wait a minute, let's go back and redo this, not necessarily from scratch, but by making a set of local transformations of your solution that improve little pieces. Uh, there's a classic book by Martin Fowler called Refactoring and another by Joshua Kurievsky called Refactoring into Patterns where his idea is that you look at large-scale patterns of what you want to do to improve the code and then you carry them out through the small local steps that Fowler recommends. So, As you refactor, you can update all these other steps, probably with not too much extra time. You're taking this offline anyway, temporarily, or doing a new version while well, the old version keeps working. So you might as well check all these other things. And if you do resolve, if you do start to resolve and you decide that you have to do a different solution or a different process, you may as well take the time at the same time to clean up the pieces of code that you're not changing or the, uh, the application. Okay. Okay, metrics. Metrics. The usual problem. And the other problem, I think it may be the most difficult, although the issue of tacit knowledge has to get folded into the change in personnel, is identifying how much the environment has changed, whether it's changed enough that you need to do anything. And in collaboration, defining, combining the partner measures that say my part has changed a little, my part has changed a little, or the, con my, the infrastructure in my part that affects my part has changed a little, my part has changed a little, oh, it's enough, is tricky. Fortunately, we don't have to be exactly right. So how do you set the thresholds? Cost-benefit analysis, I don't know. Or cost-benefit-risk-opportunity analysis, if you want to extend it. So finally, let me say, not all solutions are forever. Obviously, you need to resolve broken problems. But sometimes solved problems can benefit from resolution. Even eternal solutions, solutions that are obviously the right solutions to the problem, can benefit from, from re-examination to improve the comprehensibility, the efficiency, the accuracy, the utility, or the applicability of the solution.
Reexamination can often use the old solutions, but reexamining the process, the evaluation function, and the metrics often help. They may not change as often as the solution does, but they're particularly susceptible to infrastructure and knowledge changes. And it's important to understand cost-benefit trade-offs. Okay, I'd like to thank a bunch of people who helped me. And I'd like to acknowledge the source for the title. <laughs> Thank you.